I'm here to, to talk a little bit about, about why you might want to blog, and, and if you were going to blog, how you ought to go about doing it. So I'm just curious, how many of you blog regularly? Anybody? I, well, I don't know. If you're willing to admit to regularly, then it's regularly. You know, nobody. Okay, this is good to know. So, so I, here's the thing. So, so actually, David alluded to this early on in, in, in what he was saying when he was introducing um, Samin, that that we do have, an, I think, an ethical responsibility to transmit the knowledge that we have to a broader public. Um, how many of you are somewhat worried about declining? Uh, grant funding levels. Okay, I want to share a little story. Doug McGee is in the audience, and he may not remember this, but about my first week in graduate school, he stormed off the elevator, and I said, wow, Doug, what's wrong? And he said, I just got back from NSF, and they're only funding 22% of the proposals. Can you believe that? And I'm thinking now, wow, if NSF were funding 22% of the proposals, how awesome would that be? Um, so, so I, you know, the funding rates have been declining for a long time, and the question is, why is that? And I think there are a lot of reasons, and some of them are ones that we as scientists and, and, and cognitive scientists have very little that we can do about. But, um, but there are some of them have to do with the fact that nobody understands what exactly it is that we're doing and why it's important. Um, funding for other areas where they smash atoms together and, and play with chemicals are often at higher rates than funding levels in psychology, and yet most of us will never actually smash an atom in our daily lives. Neither will we spend tremendous amounts of time mixing chemicals together, but I can guarantee you that almost everyone that you know has a mind, and many people would like to know more about how that mind works. And they live in blissful ignorance of that because not only aren't there lots of bloggers out there, there actually aren't a lot of opportunities for people to learn much about the way that their minds work. There are very few psychology classes that are taught K to 12. Uh, if you're lucky, you take intro psych uh, as an undergraduate. Some people then go on to fall in love with the topic and take a lot of it. But most people, at best, they take an intro psych. And intro psych starts sometimes with Freud, as if you would take an intro physics class and start with Aristotle. Okay? So people are not learning a tremendous amount about the field, and yet, the results of what we, uh, the results that replicate are ones that actually can have a profound influence on the way that people live their lives. This is the preamble, and the point here is we need to be getting the word out there to people about how their lives might actually be different if they understood a little bit more about the field. Now the question becomes, how do you go about doing that and what do you tell people? And a lot of people say, but I work on something really esoteric, so nobody could possibly be interested in the specific thing that I'm interested in. So I want to start by addressing one of the questions that people, that someone asked about, well, how do you talk about studies if there's a possibility that things don't replicate? And there are two things that I want to say about that. The first is that in many situations, if you're actually going to sit down and write something that includes a recommendation for how people might do things in their lives differently, I strongly recommend writing about things that are old. Okay? I mean, like if a finding is 15 years old and it's and it's been sitting out there in the literature and replicated to the point where it's sort of buried in the literature, it is rare that that edifice collapses like the the some of the ego depletion stuff. And of course, anyone who's ever played with ego depletion know that it was a little hard to get some of those effects. But, um, but I think in many cases, if a finding is 10 or 15 years old already and has been replicated several times, then you can feel a little bit more comfortable making recommendations on the basis of that. I must admit there's been a rash of books recently, and I won't name any names, by people who have fairly new research findings who've written kind of self-healthy sorts of books on the basis of their findings and TED Talks. Uh, and and, um, and, and I, I actually think that that's not an ethical thing to do. I have no problem with writing self-help books. I've done it myself a couple of times. But if you look through the, what, I, what I've written, a lot of what I try to base my recommendations on are findings whose roots are old. <laughs> because, and, and you might think, well, what's the point of doing that? But remember, nobody's getting any psychology K-12. Very few people are getting anything beyond intro psych. Nobody knows any of this. How do I know this? Because we do this crazy radio show here in Austin. It's a podcast. If you do podcasts, you 
have some publicity to it, but it's a radio show here in Austin, and people like it because they don't know any of it. And we're not talking, generally speaking, about brand new stuff, but people live their lives in blissful ignorance of the way that their own minds work, and we can do something about that. And we're not doing anything about that. We're not getting out there and communicating. So what I advocate is that over the course of your career, and particularly as you gain some career stability, you should aim to tie to your field. And what I mean by that is to try to give roughly 10% of your time to bringing your research to a broader community. Now that broader community might be by blogging or doing interviews for reporters. It might actually be by giving talks in your local community. It might be by working with, with uh, government officials to deal with issues that, that for, for on which your topic relates. But not everyone has to start a blog. But all of us should be giving a chunk of our time to bringing the work that we do to a broader audience and to make it clear why additional research in the areas that we focus on will pay a dividend in terms of better education, better uh, health outcomes, better ability to change habits, all, all of the kinds of things that people can learn to do if they pay some attention to the research in psychology. And the fact is that even if your own research is, is esoteric, and a lot of it is going to be new because you're living at the cutting edge of the work you're doing, you still know way more than almost anybody else does about the way, the way psychology works in ways that you can begin to communicate that. And you could talk a little bit about, hey, here's some of the exciting stuff I'm working on. I'm curious to see how this comes out. But even if you just focus your recommendations on things that are older, you can do a substantial service. So that's one important thing to begin to think about. A second thing that's really important is to recognize that we can communicate about the most recent studies, but when we do that, what we have to do is to actually give people some details about the research that got done. Notice these days in the, in the, in, in, in the newspapers, the headline tends to be, you know, sugar's bad for you. Wait, no, sugar's good for you. Wait, no, it's bad for you. Salt is okay. I mean, we, it doesn't talk about the study designs. It just gives you the conclusions. The fact is there are lots of venues that you can write for where you can actually delve into the details that of the studies that have been done. Uh, I've been blogging for Psychology Today of all places for eight, almost nine years. Uh, when I first heard the term blogging, I guess. And, and a lot of what I do is to write about, hey, here's a cool paper that just came out. Here's some fun stuff about it. But mostly, here's what they did. Read about the methods here. Get to, Familiar yourself, familiarize yourself a little bit with the way that psychologists go about doing their business because part of what we want people to understand is not just a broad set of conclusions, but these are the kinds of things we have to do in order to try and gather data. And if you have a problem with that, good. You know, it's good for you to be critical of some of the methods, to think, you know what, maybe this wasn't the best way to get at this. But at least for people to begin to understand some of what goes on behind the curtain in the science that we're doing so that they can get an appreciation for what it is that's required. Psychology is really hard to do. I, I've always called cognitive science the field where Nobel laureates come to die, right? Because they go and they get their, their, their Nobel Prize in some other field like physics or chemistry, and then they say, oh, those silly psychologists, they haven't figured it out yet. Let me go clear it up for them. And then they waltz into our field, never to be heard from again. Because it turns out people are way more difficult to understand than atoms are and molecules and things like that, in part because we can't break them. We have to treat, we don't have to treat subatomic particles ethically, but apparently we have to, you know, but we know we have to treat our, our research participants ethically. We can't raise them in habits, you know, we're teaching them the language that we choose to as fun as that might be. Um, and, so, and so as a result, it makes it extraordinarily difficult for us to do our work. People need to understand the, the, the kind of work we do, the way we do it, and, and how all of these pieces fit together. So I think it's possible to write about 
the work that's coming out now, but the way you write about it is to describe the work, not to immediately leap to, and therefore, we should be teaching this weird, weird construct in every school, for example. Okay, so, now how could you go about doing this, okay? It turns out that the skill of trying to communicate with ordinary people who are not well-versed in psychology is very, very different from the skill of communicating with people who are in the field. And the reason for that is because when you write a journal article, whether you realize it explicitly or not, you are playing a chess game. Okay, this is the way that journal articles go. You think, well, this is the statement I want to make. Reviewer A is going to object to this statement in this way. My answer to that reviewer's objection is this. That reviewer is then going to counter with that. And so I'm going to lead with this statement that is designed to head off an argument two layers deep from the thing that I really want to say. And we're all fine with that. Because we all kind of understand that that's the nature of the game we're playing. The problem is that when you are communicating with people who don't know the field at all, they're not actually taking that same critical orientation. We need to lead them through the process, which means simple declarative sentences are wonderful. Okay, we have which we, we lose those when we when we write uh, for journals, and so part of what we need to do is to actually come out and just say, "This is what they did. This is what they found. This is what I think it means." And, and it turns out that when you do that, you are you are educating people in that process. But it also means that you need to think, "All right, which of the seven words I just used is no one else going to understand?" and then replace those words with other words that are smaller that more people will be aware of. And, to, and, then, and then to show it the first couple of times around, to show it to other people and say, did this, like, like, and then when I say other people, I don't mean your colleague down the hall, I mean like your mom. And say, did this make any sense to you? And, and get to the point where they, where they sort of say, yeah, I, maybe. And, and that's, that's the point at which you're getting close. Okay, so you want to practice that. Now you want to practice that not just by writing things where it's very hard to get feedback. It's also important to get up in front of some groups. So like, you know, find find a group. You know what you know what groups are really receptive to this is coaches, not athletic coaches. There are lots of people now whose job is to be a coach. I don't know what that means, but I know that they, they don't and I know that they don't know what it means either. But they want to know some things about people. And so they're really hungry to learn some psychology. So they're really great groups to get up in front of and just talk about something that you think is really interesting. And then they'll give you really good feedback later. So find groups like that and, and have conversations with them. Give a little, give a little 25 minute talk about something you think is cool and then find out what they thought about it and get feedback. It's a great way of integrating yourself into a community of people. Now you might say, well, why, what's in it for me? I mean, why, why should I do this? And, and I'm going to give you a couple of answers for that. One thing that you're doing is you are making the world safer for cognitive science, which is important, right? Because funding levels are never going to go up unless people actually think that the work that we're doing is really important. And they're never going to think the work is really important unless people are talking about it. And the only way we're going to get people to talk about it is if they know about it. And they're only going to know about it if we tell them because it's not going to be journal, nobody's going to wake up one day and say, gosh, I wonder what was in the latest issue of J.P.P. Jones, right? <laughs> it's just not going to happen. I mean, I, I'm looking forward to that day, but I'm not, I'm not holding my breath for that. So we have to begin to tell people. So I think that's one reason. But here's something else. Here's another reason why it's really important to engage with groups of people. And it's, it has to do with what I call the 20th questions. One of the really interesting things about getting up in front of groups and talking is that most of the people that you talk to are actually really, really smart. They just don't know any psychology. And so what they do is they see a psychologist standing in front of them. And I, I recommend that you bracket this. You say, listen, I will answer any question you have as long as it doesn't start with, I have this friend. Okay? <laughs> and then people will just ask you random questions that they've been thinking about. And they, of course, don't know the boundaries of of areas within psychology, so you have, to, you have to be willing for a certain number of things to say, you know what, that's way outside my area of expertise. I'll look that up and send you an email about it. 
But the fact is that a lot of times they, they figure out like what area of psychology you're talking about and they start asking you all these interesting questions. And what I find is 19 out of every 20 questions that somebody asks you, there's an answer there in the literature. That, that somebody asks you a question about memory or attention or vision or something like that and you can think, you know what, I've seen studies that relate to this. But every once in a while, about 1 in 20 times, somebody asks a question that's really, really interesting. And you think to yourself, gosh, I don't know any studies on that. And then you go back and you look, you realize, I don't know any studies on that because there aren't any studies on that yet. Because our literature has weird gaps in it. If you think about how studies get done, how do you decide to do a study? Generally speaking, it's because you read some other paper and you got annoyed by it. And then you think, I've got, I've got to run another study and prove that this is wrong or that this works this way and not that way. And so the literature grows up in these clusters around topics that people have thought were interesting. Which means that there's a whole bunch of other stuff out there that people do all the time that never gets studied because it just hasn't, it hasn't become a cluster yet. But other people are really interested in that. And we have blind spots for that because we are hyper-focused on the kinds of things that sit out there in the literature. So then when somebody asks you a question and says, well, well what, what about this? And you think, no idea. And you go and you look at the literature and you realize there's nothing there. Now that's a gap. And the beauty of gaps is you do some studies, and it doesn't matter how they come out, which way, in some ways, because, because as long as you can get some consistent results over several studies, you've actually got an interesting effect there, and nobody knew about it, because nobody had ever bothered to look. So I think that there are opportunities to discover really interesting research questions by getting out there and talking to people. And there's yet another thing that I think is important. For those of you, several of you raised your hands when I asked who might be concerned about research funding. And, and one of the things I want to point out to you is that it is unlikely, certainly given the cast of characters who are likely to be running for president in the next election, it's unlikely that there's going to be a massive increase in funding in the science budget over the next eight years or so. I'm just, I'm guessing. So the question is, where are you going to find your money to do your research? Well, it turns out the more time that you spend talking with people outside of academia, the more situations that can come up where someone might know somebody who has money, either because there are foundations out there. You know, there are people who just have money and they want to give it away. It's weird. Um, so, so you know, but you, well, we don't know them because we're academics. We don't hang out in those circles. But if you talk to other people, sometimes they know those people. And then they can say, you know what, somebody cares about this topic. Um, sometimes you bump into somebody who works for a company and says, you know what, I'd really love to have an answer to this question. And so, I mean, I actually, I literally went to a company in downtown Austin and gave a talk on similarity uh, not long ago. I mean, like detailed models of similarity because they were using similarity calculations to figure out, uh, to figure out how, um, how knowledge was set up. It was structured in a, in a big database that they had. Of, in their activities, right? So that it turns out that companies care about the kinds of stuff that we do. And sometimes they're actually going to turn around and pay you money um, to, to do research on topics, right? And, and honestly, we're going to, we are going to, as a, you know, we're going to have to get more creative in finding research funding over the next 25 years because it's just not going to come from the government the way it used to. And if that's the case, the only way that that's going to happen is get out there and cultivate that landscape and make people aware of why the work that we're doing is so important. Okay? And then finally, finally, you know, I just I just think that that we, you know, just to just to repeat one thing I said and then we'll go from this other question. I think it's really important to recognize that a lot of us who have spent time around psychology, we see the world differently than people who don't know anything about psychology pay a little bit more attention to the context in which people uh, engage in their behavior. We pay some more attention to individual differences. We are aware of issues related to people's attention. We are aware of the kinds of things that we spend our lives reading. And it can be a little bit difficult sometimes for us to imagine that there are other people who are very smart people and live in real blissful ignorance of everything that our field studies and have no earthly idea about some of the things that we now take for granted because of what we've studied. And so I do think it's really important just to present this knowledge to people because
because I, I think that if you actually pay attention to your own life for a week, you would realize there are things that you do differently, whether it's the way that you study or the way that you write or how you decide to get ready for bed at night or whatever it is, that there are things that you do in your life that have been informed by your understanding of cognitive science. And nobody else has this information, right? We, we actually can, can actually affect people's lives in a very positive way. And I think that, that there's an ethical responsibility that if we have been entrusted. Remember, a lot of us are working at universities. And thankfully, society has seen fit to sequester people like us in places like universities where we can't do any serious harm on a daily basis. But I think it's really important for us to actually not only not do some harm, but to do some good. Because not only are funding institutions under attack, but universities are under attack. People do not understand why each and every one of us is not in a classroom 24 hours a day teaching. They don't understand the value of the knowledge we create. And so we're going to lose this if we don't get out there and start telling people. So it is an imperative on a variety, in a variety of ways that we do this. And it's not hard to do. And by the way, if a reporter calls you and you think you can answer their question, answer their question. They're, you know, reporters, most reporters who are reporting science want to get the details right. So just keep repeating what you're saying over and over again until they can repeat it back to you. Okay? And and then and I, I mean I've been I've been pleasantly surprised that I mean I think I think I've probably done 500 interviews for reporters and there's probably like two of them that I'm, that where I'm not happy with the way that that I was quoted at the end. This isn't like political reporting. They're not trying to play gotcha. They actually want to learn something and you can teach them. So get out there and, and spread the word about the field. Again, it doesn't have to be your particular work. But you know a lot that nobody else knows. And you're the only ones who can give it away. So, any questions? I believe passion is. Yes? No. I'm like, even when you read articles that are in your own expertise, often you have no idea what they actually did. Yes. So yes. it seems like that could be an area of focus, and then also making notes really available to the public. So. Yeah, so, so I think you're right. So the, so, the, so the comment, I mean, it's a comment there, which I think is really important. We could write our journal articles better, and we could make them more freely available. The fact is, though, think back to, what, to when you first started reading journal articles. You know, maybe you were a sophomore in college. And everything in the results section was gibberish because you hadn't taken stats yet. And so there were all these letters and then parentheses and then keys and three things. You know, and the problem is that no matter how well we write them, the general public is still going to have a hard time making heads or tails of them. Because we, once we have some expertise, we look at papers and we immediately understand, oh, they're citing this paper because they want to, they want to locate themselves in this part of the field. And, you know, at some point, you can sort of read a paper in 20 minutes because you're like, oh, okay, that's where they put themselves in the field, that's what they did, that's what they found, and done, right? And, and you know, anybody outside the field is never going to get that. So, yes, I, I do think, I, you know, as, as someone who edited a journal for nine years, please write your papers more clearly. Um, I, yes, but I think at the same time, that's not going to be a substitute for it. Um, but here then. Um, so I would really love to be as optimistic as you are about the quality of science journalism. Um, and right now I'm not, because I've seen cases where I wrote for science and general and it was much less nuanced than it actually is. But I'm wondering if you have any advice for those of us who are more pessimistic right now about how well our education can be translated into uh, an article. Yeah, so how can we make sure that the, the reporting gets better? So for one thing, um, I think there are two kinds of science reporting that go on. One kind of science reporting is I put out a press release on my brand new study and I'm gonna get and I'm gonna get interviewed about that. And the other is a reporter, I so, so I'll give you an example. I I got a 
call from a reporter today about what she was referring to as tech support rage. So why do people get so angry when they're talking to people about tech support? Right? And wanted a psychology perspective on that. That wasn't my study, but there are lots of concepts that we all know about that relate to that. And things like, like focus and control and stuff like that. Where there's stuff we can talk about that at least give them some insight into why being stuck in a situation might, might drive people you know, uh, to battle. Right? So, so, so one thing I'm advocating is try and catch people when they're doing something else. Right, where you can inject science into their thinking about a different topic. And I think that that's the place where I think we're going to have the most success. I actually think that trying to do a press release on a new study and then publicizing that is, the problem is they need a lead. Okay? And, and so I actually, I actually avoid that. Personally, I avoid that like a plague. I have never put out a press release on a brand new study that I've done, ever because I think it's really hard to do that right. And so what I prefer to do is to find ways to inject science into discussions where people didn't expect it. And there's a case where then, because they've got their lead already. They're interested in, in you know, tech support rage. But it turns out they can learn a little bit of psychology along the way. And that, I think that works much better. Um, can I just add one comment? Yeah. Yeah, just, uh, I've also done a, a, lot of, a lot of interviews with their reports. I have one very specific suggestion that helps get them to email you the questions in advance and respond by email. And, and then what I always do is say, and happy to talk on the phone to follow up. And that way, your responses are exactly the way you want them. That increases accuracy of reporting. Question here. Thanks. I was wondering about the Yeah, that's a great question. Blogging versus podcasting. So I, I've done both over the last several years. Um, I do think that the audiences are different because it's the difference between those people who, who want to sit in front of their computer when they should be working and reading something they shouldn't be reading versus those people who are sitting in their car in traffic listening to podcasts and kind of recreating their own radio experience. So I do think people that it's slightly different. I, I think that it is, it, the problem with podcasts is Interviews are, generally speaking, really boring to listen to. And so you've, you've got to find another way to engage people. So like we just do a goofy conversation for seven and a half minutes. And I think actually seven and a half minutes is about as long as you can get to talk about it and get people to pay attention. But I think the key, if you're going to do any podcasting, is, is, to, is to bring people into a conversation rather than doing an interview where somebody where usually one person is something trying to sell. So it's, I just, I, 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 I find, I just find I tune that stuff out after a while. Um, or unless the interviewers wait, which there are some great So, um, so a, a couple of I'm just going to finish it now. But, but, blog, you know, so, so, but, but I do think, I do think, you know, and I, and, and, and so, and so what I would say is blogging is easier for someone to do when you're just getting started transmitting information because you can write something and there's lots of venues. And anybody who wants to blog for psychology today, I can get you in like that. But um, but but they really want few scientists. So I mean, they they, they want fewer kind of just people making stuff up. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Um, so blogging is easier to do if you're just doing it yourself. The problem with podcasting is ultimately you need a really good producer, okay? Who actually not not like a scientist, but like a, like a radio person who actually understands audio production and, and have, like my podcast. We talk for a half hour. They cut it down into essentially a ransom note. Um, in which individual words are taken and strung together in coherent sentences and make us sound better than we were. Okay, so you need someone like that if the podcast doesn't succeed. So anyway, that's okay. Yeah. Well, well, so uh, uh, Art brings you around to the flip side. I will do it. Okay, so those of you who have more questions for Art, uh, but thank you for that wonderful.